Hey, everyone, I'm John Kane, and I welcome you to Let's Talk Native on this Saturday, September 28th. While this program may not provide a path to spiritual enlightenment, we do encourage, and in some cases, start conversations. We don't do prayers, and we don't do buffalo speeches. We take a tough look at history, his, uh, our pr oppression, our survival. We talk about culture, the arts, politics, and identity, and we do step on a few toes along the way. But our real goal here is to bring people together by breaking down what separates us. We'll take on the, the false narratives and provide critical thinking to all that is being heaped upon us, and we do it all right here from the Cattaraugus territory of the Seneca Nation. So let's talk native. But before we do, let me remind people that we um, stream audio of the show on our website, which is www.letstalknative.com, and we stream uh, video of the show on our Facebook live page, our Facebook group pages via Facebook Live. We take the audio of the show, we put it up as a podcast after the program. We take the video of the show, and we put it up on our YouTube channel, which is Let's Talk Native TV. But I do encourage people to check out our website, and I do encourage people to subscribe to our YouTube channel and our podcast so you can catch a lot of what we're doing here, including our short-form videos that we put up on our YouTube channel as well. Um, I am the host and the producer of Let's Talk Native, and I am joined in studio by Jake Proud, who is managing our video and our sound. And, uh, let, well, let's get into it. What I want to talk about today is there seems to be, and, and, and I know there's a motive here, there seems to be a, uh, an obsession with trying to definitively, and this is the, that's part of the key here, definitively um, establish where Native people came from. Uh, you know, because it's just, it's not fully acceptable because of the whole, um, whether you want to call it the immigration issue or whatever, uh, that, that we could have always been here. I mean, our stories, our creation stories, have us always having been here. You know, and, and we always say it since time immemorial, which is pretty accurate. Um, we have no part, I don't know any Native people who have a creation story that talk about uh, coming here by, via boat, you know, or you know, migrating from, you know, from Asia or, or Europe or, you know, or, or, or any place else. Now, I'm not suggesting that there haven't, that, that there hasn't been people who have come to um, our lands here, to the Western Hemisphere, uh, uh, you know, from, from Greenland and Iceland, the Vikings. I mean, I, I, I believe you know, the, uh, uh, the, the anthropology to suggest that Vikings came to, uh, to North America. I believe, uh, you know, the, all the, 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 the theories about uh, about Africans uh, you know, coming across the Atlantic to uh, to South America, I, I believe that that probably happened as well. I don't dis disbelieve uh, the Polynesians from the South Pacific would have made it to, to South America. Nor do I disbelieve the idea that uh, that Asians may have followed the shorelines or found some means, you know, via a land bridge or or whatever, uh, may, perhaps over to frozen tundra. Uh, uh, come from uh, from Asia, you know, via Siberia and such. That's not what I'm debating here. Uh, the The issue that I have is that we still have kids, native kids and non-native kids, that are being taught in school in almost a definitive fashion, even though they keep moving the dates around, that native people, that n native Americans, and they keep saying, migrated here from uh, from Asia across the Bering Strait or the Bering Land Bridge, as they keep saying. And they and it's this has been taught in schools for decades. I mean, uh, for you know, for actually over fifty years, this has been this has been uh, taught this way. And I guess, and every time they do it, they they try to drag all of this data, you know, inclu including what they pull from from you know ice bores and and all kinds of other things to, to describe weather patterns and and how there was a a window, a narrow window, where a population could have, and they surmise did, migrate uh, from Asia to to North America. Now, the, and and then they want to say that somehow that that population that that migrated off that in that narrow window created the entire population of North and South America. Now, the problem is <laughs> the the dates don't work. I mean, they used to say that it was. 7,000, then 10,000 years ago. Then they said, well, well the, that uh, that ice, you know, that, that window 
for a land bridge must have been, uh, we calculated it according to weather patterns and ice bores and all, and they said 13,000 years ago. Well, every time they put a date to it, some pottery shows up, some, you know, some footsteps, you know, or, or some proof that native people have been in the Western hemisphere for uh, far longer than, than their window allows. So it was 13,000, then it was 15,000. Now, if you go online right now, and you and you and you punch in uh, Bering Strait theory. They're gonna say twenty. Now they'll say twenty thousand years ago. Then you delve into it farther. You're gonna find dates that go from everywhere from from again from twelve to twenty thousand. Now, this Graham Hancock has been making a lot of uh, noise um, over the human uh, population in the Western Hemisphere because even as that date from 20,000 has gone to 30,000, he's saying it's still 100,000 years, 100, years off. So this is what, we, we're, what we're facing here. We, we get all these, you know, these theories hit, uh, hit upon us. And look, we've been, look, we've had people try to say, suggest that we are the lost tribe of Israel. Um, again, that our population uh, you know, um, originates from, uh, some folks, you know, uh, coming across the Atlantic from uh, from Africa, and I think that that tri that that trip is absolutely possible. I I think there were skilled sailors, you know, long before Columbus that that it could have followed. Look, we know weather patterns come from the from the east coast of Africa and uh, and migrate west. We, that's where the hurricanes come from. So we know that it's possible. Uh, and, and but we keep hearing all that everybody wants to claim they know where we came from, even though. There is a certain, there is an accuracy that, that is tied to, um, to oral tradition. There, these stories may not, like I, like I've, I've said before on the, on the show, when we talk about history, we frame history in a story. We don't necessarily frame history with a story of somebody's specific name or try to, specific, uh, try to put a specific date. You know, look, we get people who try to say, oh, we know that there was a solar eclipse uh, that happened when, you know, when the Ganawida was trying to convince uh, the Anadagas or, or whatever. Or we, we, we hear eclipse stories associated with, with Tecumseh. Every, you know, so they always, they'll throw something like that in. And, and oftentimes that, that kind of gets added to the story much later than any of us ever heard it before. And then they say, oh, now we can back it out. We know exactly when the, when the, when the Haudenosaunee formed a confederacy. No, that 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 eclipse stuff was added way later. But anyway, that's not the way we um, uh, account for our history, and and I know that that may not meet the European standards for recording history, I mean, because of our oral tradition. But there is a certain accuracy to that that comes along with with the oral tradition. Now I know that there are, there are native people out there who will who will swear that they believe the sky woman creation story as you know as a definitive explanation where people and look i've had people even try to tie sky woman to uh to wormholes <laughs> coming coming to here I, i'm sorry our creation story is a metaphor and if, if i'm crushing anybody or, or again if i'm stepping on some toes this is my opinion it's a metaphor and and it's a good metaphor I mean, it, it's not, there's nothing wrong with having a creation story that, that, that tells a, um, not just a creation story, but a survival story and, and adds some elements to that creation story that, that help define a people and, and explain. And the reason for having a creation story. So when you explain that to your children, they have a sense for a, a, a distinct identity and that identity is framed not just in the creation story, but the creation story helps to frame up, uh, open up an, uh, the, the mind for understanding certain things. So, but again, without trying to, uh, to prove the creation story or debunk the creation story, the problem that I have with, with a lot of these, especially the, the single point origin theories, the ones that suggest we know where native people came from. They came from X, Y, and Z. They came from Africa. They came from, Polynesia, they came from Europe and they came from, or they came from Asia. And, and if you start using dates, like the dates that, um, 
that Graham Hancock's coming up with. Now, all of a sudden, there's no way that you're, you're going to create these windows, you know, that say, well, it must have happened here. It must have happened there. I get it. You, you can you can look at any species. And we're Jake and I were just talking about before the show. I mean, you can you can define where where bears came from and how they become distributed throughout. Um, no, I don't care how many times you watch Jungle Book. There was no bears in the, in the, in the jungles of Africa. It's, it's wrong. But anyway, I mean, we can and we know. I mean, and, and they've they've done in terms of prehistoric man. They can they it's pretty much agreed upon that that mankind essentially came from Africa. Okay. But that's not what's being played out here. That's not what I'm talking about here. We're not talking about cradles of, of human, human development, you know, from, from the origins of man. There seems to be an obsession with where native people on this continent came from. And, and it's not just about where we came from, but when we came, because it's almost like if they can say, well, yeah, native people just came here a few thousand years before, uh, before Europeans did. Of course, that's, that's crap. It's, it's just simply not true. I mean, and again, I'm not going to say that I've gone completely bought into everything that I've heard from, from Grant, uh, Graham Hancock, but, but he makes some pretty compelling arguments and he, and he draws it from, you know, from some pretty good anthropological evidence about, about native about people being on in the western hemisphere as late or as long as uh, 130,000 years ago and he and he's not saying that there wasn't people before that there's there, but you start looking for for the origins of man in a place you start getting back back past 100,000 years ago it's getting pretty hard to you know to, you know to to say okay when, when they came then i mean you start stretching that out to 130,000 years ago that's a long freaking time ago and that supports more of our beliefs that we were always here. And, and because always is relative still. So while I'm not going to sit here and tell you where native people came from uh, on, you know, in terms of how we came to be on this continent, I'm, that's, not, that's not what I'm debating here. What I'm saying is that nobody knows. And I'm not saying that I know. But when you start trying to, and they've been, pitching and, and pounding this bearing straight and you know they it's ever been it was a it was ice corridor at one time that was a that was the, the theory that there was a some sort of land corridor through uh through glaciers yeah that's what they used to say and and then they said well the ice age you know um uh put enough water on the on land that it lowered the sea level that there was that there was a, a land bridge that you know that came across uh, Okay, that may have happened too. I mean, there's even you know even when they try to do this thing with, with DNA, there's some there's some huge holes. I mean, and again, Jake and I were talking about this before the show. I mean, there's they have determined that there are, there are some DNA connections with people from Mongolia, Siberia, and 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 native people. It it still causes some some um, some time frame window issues. But I argue that if there is more of a definitive uh, distinction between Asian people, Western Asian people, or North, uh, North, or I'm sorry, Northeast Asian people, and other Asian people, I would suggest that that might, uh, that might represent a, a migration that went the other way. And there are people, you know, and we can go to Vine Deloria, others, Louis Hall, there, there are people in the past who, who, have, who have made that case. And and the thing is, if the way it's not true science, it, it, science says you gather evidence and you let the evidence take you take you someplace. You let the evidence tell the story. But if you've already got it in your mind, if you already got a bias, and you're going to try to pull the evidence that supports your theory, so if you have a theory already proposed, if you've already postulated that this is what, what happened, you're already biased in terms of the evidence that you're gathering. And, and the problem is there's been evidence that has been dismissed. There's been a lot of known evidence that, that clearly would defy the Bering Strait theory, uh, at least as it was framed for the last 50 years. And anthropologists would reject it. Archaeologists would reject it because it didn't suit them. It didn't fit, it didn't fit the narrative that they, because a lot of the narrative, you know, w w was the, the European narrative. And not that we came from Europe, but, but the Europeans felt like they were the most advanced civilization, white, white supremacy in the whole bit that they knew. 
They had to figure it out. And so if you, anybody who came up with anything that would suggest other, uh, something other than their theories, they would, uh, they would try to dismiss it. They, they, would, they wouldn't even consider the, the evidence. See, again, I, I'm, I support science. I also, you know, and I say this when I do my version of the Ohundu Gari Wadekwa. Knowledge is a great thing. But understand that there are some things that are unknowable. And I'm not saying because something is unknowable, you shouldn't look and you shouldn't try to learn, but you can't come up with every answer just because you want the answer. And if you just make up the answer, that's how that's where religions come from. <laughs> I mean, that's where religion comes from. Oh, I don't have an answer, so we're just going to make something up. Well, then, then the Bering Strait theory is nothing more. It's 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 religious dogma, just like um, Noah. And that man has only existed on the earth for 5,000 years or whatever the Bible suggests. I don't know. Because you can debunk all this stuff. You know, and look, I know there, just like there are devoted Christians who will think anything that suggests man existed on on the planet longer than 5,000 years ago is um, somehow, what, God testing somebody's faith or something like that. Dinosaur bones, yeah, they're not real. They're, 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 you know, that's just God testing you. I'm come on. Come on. Well, and, and frankly, there have been you know archaeologists and anthropologists who have been just as uh, you know ludicrous in their bias as you know some of these you know these evangelicals who who will reject anything that would suggest scientific data that that defies their Bible. I mean, again, I'm not. Uh, the Bible is a is a collection of stories too. That has been grossly manipulated by various writers and translators and and other decision makers who decide what makes it into the Bible, what doesn't make it into the Bible, and of course, then you when you translate it to to you know half a dozen different languages, and then oh no, the King James version is the one that's right. Oh come on, give me a freaking break! Like like nothing would have got, got could have got lost by by a monarch determining what the Bible really said. These are the problems we have because, I mean, look, there was a really close relationship between um, the theocracies, the, 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 the Christian leaders and science. I mean, the churches were the bastions of science, you know, for, for a period of time. And anybody, I mean, this is where you would have, you know, some of these um, uh, scientists who might say something like, yeah, the, the, uh, the, the universe doesn't revolve around the earth. They'd be cast as a, a heretic. I mean... So I mean, when 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 the church can can uh, manipulate what was considered acceptable science, just like you have almost a scientific aristocracy today that will, you know, it doesn't matter how valid a, a scientific you know scientific evidence is. There, you know, this whole idea of peer review and everything else. Well, who are they really peers, or are are they a hierarchy? So, I mean, and. And when I mentioned earlier, there is a motive here. There's a motive in trying to come up with, um, uh, I mean, uh, and, and well, well, trying to come up with, with a, um, uh, a date and a, and a pattern, because if you can suggest that, 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 that native people only nomadically migrated here and that we didn't have the kinds of ties. And look, we have a, we have a word for who we, what we call it, ongwe ongwe. And the ongwe ongwe, it means that you are a real human being. And by real, we're saying that if you aren't a human being that is, that is tied to place, if you don't have an origin, you know, and, and, or, or if you forsake that, and, and look, I, I get it. You know, black people didn't have a choice um, that that got dragged in chains, uh, you know, to to the Western Hemisphere. But when you think about every, every time I hear a story, and I don't, you know, we talk about this refugee crisis and and that kind of stuff. And when I hear people say that you know that they're they're you know they they can't live in their in their homelands because you know, of violence or war or whatever else, and and I get that. But rather than than fixing the place that you're leaving, you're going to say, okay, we're gonna we're gonna bring our biases. To a new place, and and that's what happened with Europe, coming to uh, coming to North uh, North and South America. They didn't fix what they left behind. Look, they, uh, you know, so whether you were pilgrims 
leaving religious persecution. You know, and, and let's be honest here. The original 13 colonies, they weren't colonies based on people who were leaving oppression. I, I mean, some were because they were indentured servants and that kind of stuff. A lot of this was, was people who were, who were opportunistic, just like Columbus, opportunistic, trying to figure out how to make a buck or lots of them. So, I mean, it's, when, when, you, when you consider that, that people could forsake their history, their ancestry, their homeland, their motherland, as they call it. I mean, that's not what we do. We, we haven't forsaken our, our mother, not just our motherland, but we, we, I mean, we metaphorically refer to the land, and, and, you know, like others do, we, we, not just motherland, but our mother. But look at how many people who have been able to, who, who are devoid of a certain level of humanity because they could write that off. So when we say we say that we are tied to land both in the past that we have this long trajectory of being bound to the land here and we expect to have a long future bound to this land. And and if you don't think that you say well who doesn't? Oh we, we God bless America. Yeah, but look at look at how Americans are. They don't care. They'll sell a piece of land in a heartbeat. They'll take a piece of land and they'll exploit it for every dime they can get out of it. That's not that's not only one way. That's the difference. That's what I'm talking about here. I'm talking about people who treat land as something that is not ours to own and to have, but that we have a responsibility to land so our future generations will have the same that they will be only one way too, and that they can know that their parents had a relationship to the land and their grandparents had a relationship to the land. And that their kids can have a relationship to the land. That's not what, I mean, the whole um, view that, that Americans have, you know, uh, about, I mean, as much as they'll condemn a, uh, an indigenous person from another part of this hemisphere coming here, America doesn't think twice about, well, you know, well, we're moving to Florida. That's it. Tired of winters. We don't like this place anymore. We're going to, you know, we're going to move to Florida. We're going to move to Arizona. They have no, I mean, they don't have a, 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 a bond to place. And that's, that's exactly what I'm talking about. That's what Ongo Ongo has a different, ha, that the reason we are Ongo Ongo and, and, uh, and non-native people aren't because they don't have that same bond and commitment or history to place. So again, I'm not going to, I'm not going to sit here and, and suggest that, that, man started in western hemisphere or that we you know from a you know from a humankind started here that's not what i'm what i'm saying that and i'm not so i'm not i'm neither trying to debunk creation anybody's creation story i mean i i, I had a friend who was kiowa and he said the kiowa and and if i get this wrong i'm sorry i'm blaming another friend who told me this but the that the kiowa had a um um that they were they came from underneath the ground because they they were they were ants they referred to themselves as the ant people and, you know, and they, you know, and I, I, I get that. I get the metaphor about, you know, the, again, the structure and the colony and, and, and how, how ants live and, and that, that, that the coyote could have a, my coyote friend was 350 pounds. He was the biggest ant I ever saw. But so, I mean, but I get the creation story and, you know, and we can, we can debate whether we believe these things as our, our as our, as our origin stories, creation stories are not meant to be history. They're stories that, 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 that teach something about who we are. And, and so, again, I'm not trying to assert the creation story as the definitive explanation on how we got here. I'm just, I'm just uh, debating and challenging um, anybody else's uh, creation story and our, our origin story that they, that they try to fashion for us because that's what they do. They try to fashion it for us. They're trying to tell us where we came from. They're trying to tell us when we got here. And, and again, when I talk about motives, the, the motives behind this kind of thing is that is our, as we try to um, promote the, the indigeneity, our, 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 that we are indigenous to this land. Look, I've flat out had people say, no, you're not. Nobody's indigenous to the land. You only came here a little, you, you only came here, you know, 1,000, 10,000, 20,000 years before, 
you know, before um, the Vikings came here. And I mean, you, you listen to all these stories and it's, and it's a way to debunk our connection to our land here. That's the motive. And I challenge that. I challenge that. All right, we're at the, we're at the bottom of the hour. We'll take a break here and we'll, we'll come back. And uh, I, I want to go through a few other things, but uh, we'll, we'll come back and we'll, we'll pound on this a little bit more when we come back. This is John Cain. This is Let's Talk Native. Town hero, lost a life. Thanks for coming back. This is John Cain, and this is Let's Talk Native. I want to thank our sponsors. I want to thank uh, Ross and Holly John and the RJE family of businesses. I want to thank uh, Eric White and ERW Enterprises, and I want to thank the good folks at uh, Grand River Enterprises for supporting our uh, our program here. Um, look, I also want to um, I want to do a little bit of self promotion here. I I know I've always mentioned the website in the beginning of the show, and uh, so to go to Let's Talk Native dot com, you'll you'll be treated to the videos that we do um, links to the podcast and we've got a, a photo gallery there uh, and it, we also have the media player there. So that's where you can listen to uh, the show pretty much 24 seven. You can, you, if you click on the media player, there'll be a show playing. If we're not live, it'll be a, a, um, a rebroadcast of a previous show. So there's always something you can find there. And of course, if you, if you subscribe to podcasts, you'll, you'll, you can see the, as they're listed on any of your, your favorite podcast platforms, your Stitcher, you know, um, uh, Apple, iTunes, w- w- whatever you can find it, and you'll see it categorized. Now, I don't have a whole lot of labeling associated with them. I I started to put a little bit more of a 
at least a, a, a tag on there so you have an idea what we're talking about. But you can at least see when when we uh, we put them up. So, uh, again, I encourage you to, to not only check them out, but but share them. Uh, the more that you people that you direct towards this, you know, towards some of the conversations we have here, the more people will, will participate in those conversations. And by participation, look, what I'm talking about here, I'm challenging some of the the conventional wisdom of uh, you know of the anthropology and archaeology uh, you know trade. Sure, I am, but I'm not the only one. I'm not I'm I'm not doing it as a, as a you know as an expert. Uh, but I but I know there are some experts out there who have challenged some of this stuff. I just think as a native person, I take a certain offense to to having somebody else trying to tell me um, that you know that our belief system, you know, our our, our culture is wrong, or, or and and that might not be the intent. And I and I realize science stands in direct opposition to most religious dogma. I get that, and you know, so will will science challenge you know some of uh, you know some of our belief systems? Sure, it will. I, you know, and and I think we have to take some of all that with a, with a grain of salt. But uh, but again, anyway, you can you can check out what we do here on our on our website. And again, that's www.letstalknative.com. I want to remind people that we uh, we are on Facebook and and we're we're heavily on Facebook. We we stream the show on our Facebook group page pages. I have a Facebook group page which is Let's Talk Native with John Kane, um, and and that Facebook group page has has over seven thousand members. There's no reason we don't have ten thousand because. Any one of you who are on the page can add a you can add a friend. If you if you catch this show, whether you whether you hate it or whether you love it, and if you want to find somebody as another hater to hate on it, then then share it. Then share it and, and add a friend. Uh, if you if you love the show and you think, look, I'm bringing up some things that that you know pique your curiosity and and challenge your your you know your own critical thinking, I guess. Then um, then by all means share the show. So. Um, Add, add members to the group pages. And of course, I have another page associated with my New York show, which is just Let's Talk with John Kane um, on WBI in New York City. So you've just Let's Talk with John Kane or Let's Talk Native with John Kane. You can you know, either one of those group pages. And and we share the show on uh, shows on both. And we stream the shows on, on both. So you can, you can catch the, the video of the shows there. Um, we're on YouTube. We have a YouTube channel, which is Let's Talk Native TV. And so I encourage people to subscribe to the YouTube, YouTube channel. And that's where you'll, you'll catch the videos of the show and the short form videos that we, uh, we work on from time to time. Um, and of course, like I said, if you ask Alexa or if you punch it into a search bar, uh, let's talk native with John Kane podcast, you'll find uh, a list of the podcast platforms that carry a uh, carry our show. We, we, we get the, our shows up on the podcast via SoundCloud. You can go to SoundCloud as well and, uh, and find us there. So I, I put all this stuff out there cause I, I just want people to realize that, we are trying to get a conversation that is broader than, you know, a couple of hundred people, you know, listening to the show live. And so uh, the more of you that, that that share the show and use these other uh, other parts of social media to listen to the show, the, you know, the, the bigger the conversation gets. And and again, the more of us that are that are into this conversation, the more of us that can they can add to the add to the conversation. And and, and again, part of what I my my criticism, I guess. Is, and, I, and I said this before before school started. Our kids are going to be served up a bunch of stuff that is going to be taught to them as if it's fact. And it's going to be misrepresented, whether it's in Columbus, whether it's Jamestown, whether it's Plymouth, whether it's, you know, uh, again, these, uh, these origin uh, theories. And we have to be prepared to push back on what our kids and even the non-Native kids are being taught. We've got to say, look, that is a view. That is an opinion oftentimes expressed. I mean, and because the writers of history are not really that bound to facts. I mean, they really aren't. I mean, the, the way a story is presented, even in a history book, it's framed by those who write that history book. You know, and, and again, we get into, into conversations about war crimes and how the, the Nuremberg trials, you know, held Nazi Germany guilty of all these things. At, you know, but ignore the fact that, that the United States bombed civilian targets in Japan and other places, and, and, and not not just the massive bombing of Tokyo and, and five other cities, but two atomic bombs. Nobody ever ever challenges whether there was you know a a war crime committed by the United States. It's because that doesn't fit with the with the way history wants to be, where history is is to be taught in you know, in schools. So as as Native people. 
we have to push push back on some of the uh, some of these theories and some of these uh, some of what has been postulated about who we are, and 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 including that because let, let's be honest, we we were we were cast as a primitive, almost subhuman people for centuries. Now they're not going to try to say that today, but if you've had presidents of the United States. I mean, up to fairly recently, you know, uh, suggesting that that we had not reached the level of humanity that white people had, and 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 that somehow because we were uncivilized, I mean, this is where I, I have so much trouble with words like the word tribe and tribal, because anytime that word is used anyplace else, it, it's meant to it's meant to be you know primitive or backwards, and yet we have native people who oh yeah I'm I'm, I'm a tribe. They, they embrace the word as if it has no negative consequence to it or, or, or pejorative intent to it. And, and it does. See, these are the things that I think we need to push back. Part of the reason we push back on the, on the mascot issue is because of the mockery that Native people are made of in, uh, you know, as, as white kids are playing dress up. The, part of the reason we push back on state jurisdiction and federal jurisdiction is because that, again, is condescending that that again is, is treating us as if as if we were less than them that we were less they have, they have no basis in law to suggest that they that we have been legally subjugated by the united states it's the same argument that the hawaiians have and if we accept it i mean it's one of the reasons i push back so hard when people are saying oh we get we need to get native people to vote look if you live in a city that's fine but if you live on a native territory and you're willing to join that system, that's assimilation. And, and look, if you don't think that's a bad thing, then that's fine. But, but don't take offense to it. If I, if I suggest voting in an American election, if you live on a native territory and you already have a government that you, that you work with, that, 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 that provides some services to you and you provide something, a loyalty or an allegiance to that, and yet you have this other government that, that you're somehow divided and you, and you want to play this dual citizen stuff, that doesn't exist. That's not true. You can't have dual citizenship, dual citizenship with another country if that other country doesn't recognize you the citizenship you had in the first place. So, I mean, I, and the reason we have these conversations is that we have a right. We have a right to our own history. We have a right to our own existence. And we have, certainly have a right to challenge what is, what is being served up as, as a, an answer you know, to, to somebody questioning where we come from. That's why I think challenging it, and, and I'm not saying challenging it with another theory, I, and I'm not trying to hold up our creation stories against the Bering Strait theory. I, that, that's not what, you know, again, that's not what I'm trying to do here. But I just, just think that we, we, we have the right as a part of who we are. I mean, and again, I say it's, it's in our name. It's in our name to... To, to suggest that that we have not only a history here, but we have a future here. But I'll tell you, as I'm debating with some of these people on, on Facebook and on Twitter and, and other places, where they're saying, if we don't go out and vote in their elections, we're going to lose our lands. No, you've got it exactly backwards. I mean, think, I, mean I got into this debate even over North Dakota. North Dakota is telling native people on native territories, if you don't put your physical address where you sleep at night, a legal address where you sleep at night on your voter registration form. So if you don't put on a voter registration form, the place that you live is in X, Y, or Z's um, uh, congressional district, you know, state rep you know, assembly district or whatever else, you can't vote. Well, we shouldn't be voting in their goddamn elections anyway. And why would they, and, and, and nobody's even questioning, well, why would they want that? And I heard somebody, well, you can't get electric service if you don't have an address. Yeah, I know, because they have to run wires to your house. But, I mean, to, to suggest that if, you're, that if you don't have a physical address, you can't vote? And if you don't provide a physical address, I mean, it, it should just about whether you can identify yourself. Uh, of course, the, here's the problem. Well, if you live on a native territory that's not really part of the United States, then should you be voting for a congressional representative that doesn't represent your territory? No, we probably shouldn't have. But see, this is the this is the quagmire that they've created. But we shouldn't be the answer to that problem. You know, and, and again, as as 
a very small population, a population that has been diminished so significantly over you know, the last few centuries, so significantly, we're not going to swing the, we're not going to swing a ballot one way or the other. And we're, we're never going to have a strong enough voting block, even if all Native people voted the same, which we don't, to change American policy that's going to cater to us. So anybody who thinks that, you know, okay, here's the rebel plan. We're going to all vote in their elections and change them from the inside. Sorry, that isn't going to happen. But as a distinct people, to the extent, I mean, because look, whether we are right-leaning or, or left-leaning or whether we, even if we're, we're church-going or, or whatever else, if we bind ourselves together as, as Native people, we're, we're stronger. We're stronger as a distinct people than a, a very minuscule, marginalized people in a sea of other populations. Because that's how they get away with their narratives, too. Because we don't stand up. We, we're, if we're going to accept their systems, we're going to accept their history, we're going to accept their theories about our, our origin and about you know, who we are, where we came from, when we came, without, I mean, it, and, and to say that we don't have a right to challenge that, and, and, that's, and that's, what we, that's what we hear, that's what we experience. I mean, I was listening to a, a, a reading, a, a piece about a woman who said her fifth grader wrote an essay about westward expansion. And when she, she tried to tell him some truths about westward expansion, about the greed and about the murder, about the, you know, uh, you know all of that stuff, the, the kid said, but mom, that wasn't in the text that we were supposed to read to base our essays on. We have to write our essays in accordance to the, to the text that we had to read before writing the essay. So, I mean, they're being forced to, to not even provide any critical thinking. I mean, and you know, this is fifth grade. I mean, this is what these kids are going through. And this, you know, this is what children are being, are being taught. They're really saying, we're going to teach, we're going to tell you what you got to read. We're going to tell you what truth is. And then I want you to write about what truth is. So they're telling you, we want you to make it your own and reject your own, your own beliefs, reject your own ideas about the negative consequences of westward expansion or about war or about any of this stuff, because we're going to tell you it's good. We're going to tell you that it's all, uh, it all ends in a happy story. That's what James Lowen, the, the writer of uh, Lies My Teacher, told me. He said, that's what history books do. They, they even take the most heinous parts of history, and then they try to sum it up as, as that, that it all has happy endings. And they lived happily ever after. Slaves, yep, they lived happily ever after. I mean, that's, that's, the, way, you know, it, it, that's the, way, the way it gets wrapped up. See, and, you know, and, the, and the whole thing is when you, when, you, when you look at all this stuff and you look at the way various peoples have been treated throughout history, you can't just say, okay, but that was then. That's not now. No, because there are lingering effects of every aspect of that. You know, I, I showed um, Even the Rain, just a great film, Spanish language film in, in New York uh, this past week. And, you know, what you, what you see is the subtlety of, of racism, you know, and the overt racism that exists against, uh, the storyline has a, has a crew that's making a movie about Columbus. And they want to tell the heinous story of, of Columbus. But even as they're trying to show that white supremacy and the, and the abuse and the atrocities and the murder and the savagery, the, the torture, the inhumane treatment of Native people, the, the filmmakers are boasting about having, only having to pay them a couple of bucks a day. And, and taking, taking advantage of how, many, how they can add so many Native extras because they don't have to pay them anything. I mean, so the, the, it, 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 that goes beyond just the lingering effects. That's the direct effect of, uh, you know, of colonialism. So, I mean, and that's why, I mean, uh, by the way, if you get a chance and you, you, it, the film is on Netflix and you can you know, pick up the, the DVD for five bucks on Amazon, it is a great film, and if you if you watch the film, I'd love to have a conversation with you about it. And I, I've been raving about this thing for for you know I don't know six months or, or eight months or so because it, it is such a, a powerful film. And it we're running we're coming up on Indigenous Peoples Day slash Columbus Day, and I think people really need to know some of the truths. And and what we're what we're trying to accept as truths are what's being said in by in Columbus's own journals. The, the, what's being written by 
the bishops at the time, the, the religious you know um, scholars that, uh, who witnessed some of the atrocities, Columbus's own words about the atrocities he was willing to commit, the some of the atrocities that some of his men wrote uh, wrote in their journals. So, and who knows how much they, that, that those things have been uh, whitewashed before they wrote it down and, you know, in their own justification. So when we, because again, anybody who thinks that written history is so accurate, look, human, be, human beings are fallible. So the writers of history, they have no, there's no, you know, um, uh, law. There's, there's no natural force that's going to force somebody to write the truth. Even as they're, whether it's writing, I mean, uh, what's the guy's name from uh, the Pope? Uh, um, John Smith. John, so Captain John Smith never wrote anything about Pocahontas in his, in his journals at being in Jamestown. But when, he, when he's old and he's back in Europe and realized that the, the Pocahontas became, you know, this, this, you know, this, you know, popular figure in Europe, then he makes up a story about it. Nobody challenges it. And again, there you go. It's right in the history book. Oh yeah, they they they, they even usually got it illustrated. Oh, Pocahontas, this beautiful native maiden, you know, keeping uh, John Smith from being uh, executed on a tree stump, getting his head smashed. Oh, she threw her body to cover. That's all crap. And yet, <laughs> that's what's going to that's what's going to be in the history books. And it's still in the history books. They still tell that story. It's on us to to challenge it. It's on us to you know. And look, Pocahontas. That's that's that, that's not my people. It's another native people. But I'm not going to accept that. And I don't care if Disney makes a cartoon about it or not. You know, if Disney wanted to tell a story and make up a story about native people, then they they should have made. They shouldn't have used, uh, a, you know, some semblance of real characters and then turn it into into a love story that never happened. Pocahontas was raped and kidnapped, forced to marry. You know, an, an older man. And it wasn't even John Smith in the first place. These, these are the kinds of things that we, that, we have to, that we have to play a role in. And, and it's not just about being angry about it. I, I think we have to be level-headed. I think we have to um, be conscientious about uh, understanding, you know, look, that, that people are going to try to hit us. They're going to hit us with, with what they're calling facts. And we have to be prepared to, uh, to, to debunk them. And to challenge them, and, and and not just challenge the veracity, the truthfulness of those of those facts, but where are you saying they came from? Because that's where where I mean, again, understanding the influences of of religion and how much they come into in, into effect. Even even I mean, it's amazing how many people who are. It seems like if you were a scientist, the first thing you'd have to reject is religion. I mean, it almost seems like in today's modern age, I don't know how you could be a scientist. And be a devout, a, a devoted Christian. I don't know how you can be that. Honestly, I don't know how you can be because you because almost all of your study, whether it's in astro, you know, you know, astronomy or whether it's in biology. I mean, you've got to you've got to you um, reject uh, evolution. You've got to reject origins of man. You've got to re reject all of this stuff to conform to to this religious dogma that has been, you know. And one of my friends says, you know. It's 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 an old book. It's uh you know it's you know it, it was written so many years ago. And I said, well, that's kind of not true either. The Bible gets rewritten every time somebody needs to, needs to change it to suit their uh, their assertion of power, and that's what's happened. I mean, they change. I mean, look, and it's not just the Bible. I mean, the same thing happens with the with the Torah and the and the Quran. There are people who are going to select the pieces out of this stuff to justify their behavior. You know whether it's you know justify a, you know war or or killing or or subjugation of women, you know or, or you know or or gay people or anybody else. Either they'll pick out what they want out of there. They'll ignore some of the stuff that talks about you know loving all people, and and a lot of these good books have that stuff in it, but they'll find the stuff that that that'll justify death, that'll justify cruelty, because you know what all those books got that stuff in it too. Look. The world, nature, is exists with a certain level of tension. So when we talk about harmony and we talk about balance, the world is not a a, a completely placid um, 
environment. No, there's tensions. There, I mean, not just tensions because of, of things like weather and, you know, uh, but it, there's a certain fight for life, right? You know, it, it's not just the, the food chain or the, or the hierarchy, but there, you know, we, we struggle for food. We struggle for warmth. We struggle for, you know, protection. We, you know, most uh, animals uh, don't look to the future at least we don't think they do, the way man does. Man worries about uh, about the future. So they marry, or they worry about accumulation of stuff, of of wealth, of, of money, of food, all, all this stuff. I mean, and in some, there's certain, you know, uh, common sense that comes with that. But there also comes with the idea of, of accumulating stuff that turns into, you know, uh, just this blatant abuse of consumerism and consumption. You know, so you, you're going to, you not only are you going to, um, accumulate this stuff, but you're going to consume this stuff. And that's why we have, you know, kind of what we have. And that's the, that's the human existence today. You know, I uh, got into a debate with people who talk, want to talk about generosity. Oh, the United States is the most generous country in the world. No, it isn't. When you balance it out with how much the United States has taken from every place, and I'm not just talking about slavery. I mean, there's not, there hasn't exactly been reparations for it. I'm not talking about genocide. There's been no reparations. There's been no reparations for any of the abuses that not only colonization, but the establishment of the United States. I mean, we could argue that the United States committed more atrocities than any other country did when it comes to, again, westward, westward expansion. And then imperialism that would go beyond the continental uh, United States into Hawaii and into uh, the Philippines, into you know, um, uh, some of the, the Spanish colonies as, as the United States was trying to displace them. The fact that the United States has, has a military presence in, in 70 other countries. I mean, the, the, by sheer consumption, you have to understand that the United States are takers, they're not givers. I mean, the reason that they, they import so much is because the United States are consumers. I'm not saying the United States don't produce. They do. They produce, and then they consume everything they produce, too. They're not big exporters. They're, big, they're bigger importers because of the sheer volume of consumption. Now, anybody says, well, yeah, but look how much money the United States donates. Yeah, but look at the, look at the impacts of the consumption that the United States has. If you, if you, if you put a net, you know, if, if you, you know, do the math on, on how much of the rest of the planet has to produce to satisfy the consumption of the United States, it is clear that uh, they are the takers, not the not the givers. I mean, for uh, as everybody's you know um, criticizing Bolsonaro down there in, in Brazil, the United States is are, are are among the biggest consumers of of Brazilian beef. Where do you think those rainforests are going to? They're they're going to to the production of of beef and and then of course grain crops to support that beef. How many people are prepared to walk away from uh, from McDonald's or Burger King and not eat the hamburgers anymore when they find out that their hamburgers are taking away rainforest? I mean, it's not just the big, fat, juicy uh, cuts of steak that are coming from Brazil. No, it's the crappy hamburger you're eating at the at McDonald's too. This, you know, you know, again, the amount of consumption, the amount of taking. So when I hear. You know, some, you know, some good Christian woman telling me, oh, the United States is so generous. Well, you're not doing, you're not doing the full math. You're, you're trying to measure it in dollars and cents, not in, in, the, in the real costs, the real costs that, that are associated with, with climate change, with carbon footprint, with the exploitation of, 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 of cheap. Look, when I hear people say that China or Mexico is stealing jobs, bullshit. It's the greed of, of corporate America that says, no, we're not going to pay uh, Americans to do this job. We can, we can get the same job done. You know, um, we, we, what we have to pay an American in a week, we can get a month's wages out of a Mexican. So we'll, we'll, go, we'll build the, the cars in Mexico. We'll, go, we'll get the jeans and the, and the sneakers done in, the, in Vietnam. These, these are multinational corporations that... Yeah, they enjoy all of the the, the benefits of uh, of you know God blessing America as they're exploiting the crap out of people all over the planet, including 
the you know the extraction of uh, of materials for their for their products, the dumping of of the of the crap after it's all done, the exploitation of cheap labor. Don't tell me how generous the United States is. They they don't they don't pay a Mexican what they'll pay an American uh, to build their, their their Chryslers or their General Motors. That's not generosity. That's greed. That's taking. So. Look, we need to we need to be more assertive in our narrative about who we are and about our relationships, including the relationship that is the biggest challenge that we have. And that is the relationship we have with the, with the colonizing effects of the United States. And and it's not about hate. I don't, I'm not saying I hate Americans. I don't. I guess I, that might work for Donald Trump, but uh, but no, it's it's not about hating on people, but it's about saying no. I'm not going to accept the relationship that that is so lopsided. So if you want to be my friend, if you want to be my ally, then you have to. It has to start with understanding who I am, and it has to start with you. Ceasing to that you stop trying to define who I am, where I come from, when I got here, and and what is my subordinate relationship to you? If that's the way you're viewing me, then we're then you're not my ally, you're my oppressor. Bottom line. All right, folks, I want to thank again you for listening. To the show, I, I mean, please do share the show, um, share the podcast, share the videos, and uh, and like. I can't say any plainer than this. Let's just have the conversation. Let's talk. Let's talk native. Yahweh.